spur over towards the southeast. Again, we're looking at widely gusts of 40 miles an hour, locally 50, and along the south coast, potentially 50 to 55. All these gusts are potentially damaging, so something to bear in mind, especially if you are camping. Charlie Nega. Carol, thanks very much. We'll chat to you later on. Thanks. Let's take a look at today's papers, many of the front pages leading with the government's announcement that it will offer pay rises of between 5 and 7% to public sector workers. The Mirror says the pay offer has come at last after months of strikes. Let's have a look at the uh, Telegraph turning its attention to doctors' responses to that pay offer, reporting that medics have been urged to give in by senior conservatives and accept that pay deal. The junior doctor strike will continue as planned and to its second day today. Consultants due to walk out for two days next week. The Metro is leading on the England player Deli Alley, praising his bravery for opening up about his sleeping pill addiction. It reports that the football star revealed on a podcast that he spent six weeks in rehab to kick the addi addiction and to cope with the trauma of being sexually abused as a child. And looking at Times, they say a report by a group of MPs revealing that China has tried to infiltrate British intelligence agencies with its spies as part of what it calls prolific and aggressive espionage campaign. You liked this picture today, didn't you? It did catch the eye, because it, you have, it takes you a little while to just sort of tune into what's going on. That is a lot of golden retrievers Why in one that? place. Apparently it's a record. Uh, this is the ancestral home of the breed in the Scottish Highlands. Our first golden retriever puppies are born. This is Mansion House in Glen Affric, 155 years ago, that's like a sort of uh, one of those pub quiz type questions. Where did golden retrievers come from? And that picture, look at them, there's so many of them. You get they a sense of how different the colourings are as well. A lot of paler ones and the much more sort of honey coloured ones. Very sweet. Picture, isn't it? Um, are you a donut fan? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't seek them out often, but yes, I'm not, a, I'm not averse to a donut. Yeah, no, you don't go donut hunting, but you'll eat one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, Delia Smith, yeah, of course, um, Diane of, cook of the cookery world, um, went out with some friends in Norfolk, went to Eric's Fish and Chip Shop in Holt, and their friends ordered a deep fried jam sandwich. How does that sound to you? Well, I'm not over keen on the idea of hot jam, because I think it's always going to burn my mouth. Good point. I think you'd have to be careful. Still, they tried it. Delia Smith loved it so much. She's put it on the menu at Norwich City, um, of course, which she, she owns a majority share in, football club. Um, and she's asked them if they'll serve it and they're going down a treat. So this is, you know, Delia, Delia got lemon zesters to sell out mm. when she first started talking about her lemon drizzle cake. She obviously has, you know, the Delia effect on food. So I think we will be seeing many more deep fried jam sandwiches, but I hadn't thought about the hot jam. Don't thing. worry me. I think there's a lot of people who will get, because uh, jam, I... I think jam would stay hot for a very long oh, time. It's not like tomatoes. They're very high, have very, uh, uh, you know, um, water retention. content, don't oh, they? Right. So they keep the water for a very long time. So I'd be worried about that. Also, if I'm having a sandwich, that's not my, you know, but I'm apparently not going it's that just direction. like a donut. So yeah, if you like yeah. donuts, you might like that. Look out for it in a cafe near you. So time now is 19 minutes past six. Generations have enjoyed youth hostels. They've been an affordable haven for students, backpackers, families. But like many sectors, COVID and recent economic pressures have meant that costs there are rising. Now, the Youth Hostel Association is looking to sell off some of its sites and hope they'll become independent hostels. Now, Hannah is in Bakewell in the Peak District. Enjoying the views as so often you can there. Glorious morning, a little bit hazy, but it's about what's happening inside, Hannah, that you're focusing on. Absolutely, yeah. Just look at that view there from this youth hostel here in your group near Bakewell. You don't get a view like that from many hotel rooms, but you certainly do in this shared room, which is all set for some guests to come later tonight. But now the Youth Hostel Association has announced that it's selling off 
20 of its 150 sites. It says it needs to do that in order to secure the long-term prosperity of the charity. They fell on particularly hard times during the pandemic when they lost around 80% of their normal income. Of course, sharing rooms like this were not particularly COVID friendly at the time. Now, the charity makes around 90% of its income from just 60% of its sites. And they hope that by selling off some of the properties that they have, they come to more than 10 million pounds in value, the properties, they hope that that will help them to make the charity more sustainable and, and allow people to come to places like this and see views as spectacular as the one that we have just seen. So they hope that some of them will continue to be run as franchises like this one has been in the last couple of years. We'll come on to that in just a second because that is the future of the Youth Hostel Association potentially. But first, let's have a look back at how it all started. With spring here and summer on the way, Britain's youth hostels enter their busiest season. And with good strong boots and a rucksack, they're ready for anything and anywhere. Keeping people cheerful on the cheap. For nearly a century, youth hostels have provided an affordable way to holiday. Thousands of young people each year spend their holidays and weekends this way, discovering some of the loveliest parts of the country, all for a few shillings. The original was actually in Germany, set up by a schoolmaster in 1909. It wasn't until the 1930s that the first British site opened in St Albans. The idea was to get young people outdoors, providing facilities for schools and youth groups and those taking their first summer holidays without parents. This party is on another YHA holiday this time in the Yorkshire Dales. Often based in the heart of the countryside, the charity's hostels, cabins and campsites pride themselves on giving visitors the chance to experience adventure and build new skills. I spend as much time as I possibly can youth hosteling because it enables me to meet a lot of people with my own interests. Now, 93 years since their first one opened, youth hostels are changing and trying to remain popular with all ages as hundreds of thousands choose to stay in them each year. Well, we've come down here now to the bakery at this youth hostel, which they've just added in the last few weeks or so. I think you can see Matt over there making some loaves. Morning, Matt, how are you? <laughs> Good. They're getting busy for the day, where they'll be getting visitors, not just people who are staying here in the youth hostel, um, but also people who live in the community nearby. And I'm going to come now and talk to Colin, who took over this site. Morning to Hi, you. Hi. How's it been? You took over this site about just over two years That's ago. Right. Yeah. What's it been like? Um, really exciting, uh, challenging, but fun. It was at the end of COVID. It was lockdown when, when I bought it. But it's just a fantastic building and a great location, isn't it? And I, ju I just believed that I could do something special with it. I was going to say, what made you want to do it? Yeah, so I'd been looking to buy a hostel because I'd stayed in so many of them over the years in the UK and abroad and just thought it would be a fun thing to own and to try and uh, put my mark on, really. And I mean, we can see there you've got books, you've got this cafe going on. Presumably that's for the local community and things as well. How yeah. have they found it since that you sort of took it over and changed things a little bit? Yeah, but they've been really supportive. So they've not had any reason to come in this building over the years. It's been a hostel. They didn't need a hostel for themselves. So now we've opened the doors and created a hub for, for the village to meet. And the response has been fantastic from the locals. They love our bread, they love our coffee, they love the cakes. And they, they've been great. They've been the, the cornerstone of the, the success so far for the cafe. And people will wonder as well. I mean, it's called the Youth Hostel Association. You're now running it as a yeah. franchise. Yeah. Are the people that come through the doors, are they all young people? No, no, that, that's misleading, isn't it? The, the, the term is, so it's a charity that raises funds to give young people experience of, of the countryside. So people who stay here, some of the money they pay is going towards that, that end. But very often when I've been in it with, with my wife, with Christine, um, we've, we've been the only people in the hostel perhaps, or they've been people our age. And it's, no, it's not always young people. Lots of mid, middle-aged people with families, lots of school groups, but lots of people my age as well. So there's no reason why anybody shouldn't look and, and consider staying in a hostel. 
Well, thanks very much for talking to us this morning. We'll be back a little bit later talking to the Youth Hostel Association more specifically about their plans to sell out off some of the sites and they hope that they get more people like Colin to take over some of the sites. You can see there's a mosaic up there, stay, eat, drink, bike, hike, enjoy. That seems very much to be the motto of these sites and the kind of things that they hope to encourage. Should be everyone's motto really, it's a lovely one. Hannah, thanks so much. So what is one of those days on breakfast we, when we are able to offer people and ourselves a little window on the world yes. to look inside a place that you don't normally get to look at? Let's talk to you about the state rooms of Buckingham Palace because they're opening again to the public from today. Now, Royal Correspondent Sarah Campbell is there. Sarah, are you feeling rather at home there, these rather grand opulent surroundings? Morning. <laughs> I think I feel at home, yeah, absolutely. Uh, welcome to the ballroom. Um, now, there's a special display this year. I'll give you some clues as to what that display might be. This is the anointing screen. That's clue one. These are the throne chairs. That's clue two. You may have guessed the special display this year for the opening of the state rooms is all about the coronation, of course, which happened in May. And even the room here, the ballroom, had a really important role in the run-up to the coronation on May the 6th because trying to find a room that's big enough to stand in for Westminster Abbey is pretty difficult, but this is one of them. It doesn't even look now as vast as it actually is because they've got the display screens here, but take them out and it's huge. So it was laid out just like the Coronation Theatre in Westminster Abbey, which of course remained open to the public until the week before the coronation. So this is where the King and Queen in private could come and practice. I'm gonna be taking you through all the detail. These are the robes of estate. Quick question, what beloved pet of Queen Camilla's do you think is embroidered into her robe of estate? All will be revealed after the news, travel and weather where you are. Hello there, good morning. Paisley's Royal Alexandra Hospital has been forced to remove patients from two wards after traces of a dangerous bacteria were found in the water supply. 